All New Zealand members of parliament are equal. Every vote counts the same. The Prime Minister's vote has the same standing as that of the Leader of the Opposition or any other member of parliament. So when New Zealand laws are passed, they have to be passed by the House of Representatives. And unlike the Barons of 1215, if the people don't agree with us, then every three years they get to decide if they still want us representing them. Recently, I read an opinion piece from an academic that asked whether the law change to casino gambling to allow Sky City to have more pokey machines could be in keeping with the Magna Carta. Relatively certain they weren't thinking about it back in 1215. But I'd also say the question was asked, was that equality before the law? In other words, was the law change consistent with the rule of law? I thought it a rather spurious argument. For example, the law can take into account the special needs, rights or obligations of people in industry or by age. Police officers, for example, are legally entitled to carry firearms in airports. I don't suggest any of you decide that you want to have that same right too, unless you are a sworn police officer. In recent years, there has been much change in New Zealand that is properly characterised as constitutional. The New Zealand Bill of Rights Act, the change to the system of electoral representation and the Official Information Act in particular, they've been transformative. They may be sufficient change for now. Our pragmatic and adaptable constitution may suit New Zealand society and indeed has considerable virtues. It would be foolish, however, to think that constitutional evolution is at an end in New Zealand. And even if change in our institutional arrangements is not in prospect, a largely unwritten constitution needs to work, and constitutional values may provide political limits, at least if they are talked about and understood. One thing we can be sure of is that in the necessary discussions, we will continue to have on constitutional directions. The ideas of Magna Carta will continue to be drawn on, as they have been for the past 800 years. So these two purchases, the Whanganui purchase and the Waimarino purchase in the Whanganui district, are clear examples of how the impact of colonisation, which, if you look around the world, you will note is always a brutal process for the colonised how that was exacerbated when the Crown failed to regulate its own conduct in conformity with the norm that it too was subject to the law, the norm for which we have the Magna Carta to think. So when we try to address the question, what did Māori get out of colonisation, the light of civilization supposedly imported with the English should have had as its most intense and brightly burning part the light of the rule of law, a fair, impartial system of laws and obligations to which all were equally bound. And if the colonizers had maintained their focus on that gift of the Magna Carta, the worst treaty breaches that the Waitangi Tribunal investigates today would have been many fewer. As the Waitangi Tribunal has recently noted, Māori had their own system of laws and authority. The Māori system of law centred on the imperatives of tapu and utu, handed down by Atua, but interpreted and applied in the temporal world by rangatira and tohanga. So where Article 3 of the Treaty of Waitangi guaranteed to Māori the rights and privileges of British subjects, including the rule of law, the translated phrase for that of tikanga katoa would have been recognised by Māori as a system of law and not a system of whim. The modern state is a giant machine. This is different from a time when power was exercised by a bunch of loosely coordinated and mostly competing feudal landlords. The machinery of modern government is large and complex. It still has and needs coercive and intrusive powers to enforce the rule of law and to protect its citizens, albeit with more legislative controls than were in place when the Magna Carta was sealed. The technology available to exercise coercive powers and for surveillance is changing rapidly, making it harder to control. 
surveillance technologies can be used and abused by both the state and private citizens. The challenge in a liberal democracy that champions not only personal freedom, but the need for personal and collective security is to get that balance right. The challenge for the Magna Carta going forward is to become relevant for more than just people who already have power. More people, more than just people like you and me who are educated, who are brought up in good homes, who have the good fortune to be white in a society that, that privileges whiteness. The challenge is to use the principles of the Magna Carta for people like us, people who have that political and social power, to speak up for people who don't, to speak up for our prisoners, to speak up for our beneficiaries, to speak up for people who don't have the money or the, otherwise the ability to give the time to these sorts of issues.